Hi everyone, my name is Mel. You may remember me from Cloud9 White, and I'm the new IGL for version one. Mel, they need to buy Jazz. You're not gonna do this. You're not gonna do this, Mel. Oh my God, Mel! <laughs> Mel holding the angle needs to hit the opener shot, and she does. A clutch shot comes through, but as Flowerful takes care of the diffuser, it's just down to the one v one, and Mel does it again. So I think if I remember right, you went from going from like a spectator in CS:GO to Magical, or when Valorant came out to Magical to C9 White, to V1, and it's obviously like a really big journey in general. What I'm curious, or like the first point that I really want to go into is, at the very core of it, like what is the drive to do all of these things? Because that's not a normal thing that just like the average person wants to do, is to actually like push for something, so, or something like that grand. So like, where does the drive from come from? What makes you want to compete? Like what actually pushed you in this direction in the first place? I think early on I had an incredible drive for it. Not to say that I don't have a drive for now, but I'll get into how it's changed later. But early on, I definitely had a huge drive because it seemed so, I don't know, at the time ambitious. And I'm talking back when I was an observer in Counter-Strike. When I was an observer in Counter-Strike Go and I was just spectating these tournaments and I was like seeing the macro and like the strategy of the game and then Valorant came out and I was like, dude, this is, I can make it as like a professional player. I could do this and play and get paid to play video games and it's going to be so epic and awesome like that's an e at the time it was such an easy like motivator to play video games for a living because at the time i wasn't playing video games for a living i was working like uh, remote gigs online mm -hmm. um before i even like moved to do any of this i was working in and out so for me it was really easy to have that um to have that motivation and drive to try and do it because it's something that I had always loved. I'd always loved playing tactical FPS. I played CSGO since I was like 15, 14 years old. I played FPS since I was like six. So it came really naturally to me, but it's definitely changed as time has went on. And I like, as my career has, you know, progressed and matured to, I got to a point where like last year, especially leading up to Berlin, and I've talked a little bit about it as well, where the more grand, at least for me, the more grand things seem the worse the pressure becomes and mm -hmm. so when in my head if people are calling me like oh you're the best you're the go you're the you're ceo of women or like i'm saying if those people said this to me last year mm -hmm. um like you're the best player you're gonna win this da, 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 da. and so when you have that kind of psychology where it's like oh wow this is such a big deal like i'm such a big deal apparently like this this thing that i play for the idea of women becoming yeah. you know one with like the the integration of the scene and co-ed is such a huge deal it's crazy like it sounds really good from like an outside point of view but when you're a player and you internalize that it actually adds a, a unreal amount of pressure because you feel like you need to be this mystical figure at least yeah. for me i felt like i had to live up to this figure to this person that people thought i was and that i had to be and so that drive kind of worked against me. But now I feel like I've kind of mellowed out after taking like a big loss um, last year where it's like, yeah, I I do have a drive, but it's more, I guess I'm more like living in the moment. Like I'm enjoying the process more of like practicing with my teammates and, you know, come, showing up to practice and just having energy and like thinking like, damn, okay, I do get to play video games for a living, that's cool. But in terms of like um, trying to be this grand voice figure or, you know, leading women to the next generation of gaming. Like, I don't think about it like that anymore. As much as like people play it up to be that way, I just am just a person. I, I go outside more, I'm more active, and I started to realize hey, that I'm- I, At the end of the day, like, I'm just sitting at my computer for 14 hours, clicking some keys, moving my mouse, and I do it well enough to get paid, so. That's like <laughs> what I'm here for. I'm not saying I'm paycheck stealing. I obviously do want, my goals are still the exact same. It's just the, I guess the manner in which I view myself and like the, how the drive impacts that. It's a lot more like mm -hmm. chilled out. It's not nearly as, as serious. It's like reasonable. it's not that deep sis. It's, yeah, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. Yeah. Like this is a cool way to live my life. I get to travel. Mm -hmm. I get to, you know, meet awesome people. I get to play with my friends like every single day and I get to have fun. And that is enough to drive me <laughs> to continue doing it. At this okay, point. cool. So there's a follow-up question there that I want, but I want to I want to save it for a second. But it's going to be about that switch from being that iconic figure to being more reasonable, or like that more reasonable pro. So I want to. Uh, there's a question there, but the the question I want to go to before that is with regards to that transition where you you see that you can maybe make a career within esports. So the the last guest that I had on is a, a Rainbow Six player that's been playing for a very long time, and when I was asking him something similar, his response was. I didn't even really 
think about going pro. It just like mm-hmm. one day it happened. And so it seems like for some people, you don't really intentionally plan to go pro and then all of a sudden, like, boom, you're on a pro team. And then mm-hmm. other people, it's a very deliberate, like, I am going to go pro. Here's how I'm going to do it. And I'm curious on, like, when you saw Valorant come out, you see the tax shooter, the possibility of it. Was this more of, like, I'm going to put together a comp team, have fun, whatever happens, happens? Or is it very intentional of, like, I'm here to get on a fucking pro team and that's that's the end of it? I would say at the, at the beginning it was very intentional, but at the same time it didn't feel forced. Like I at, at the time and looking back I'm like wow, she was really confident. Like old me or younger me was really confident because I had no doubt in my mind that I was going to like get signed to a team and that my team would get signed. I had no doubt in my mind that it was going to happen eventually. And so I intentionally did, you know, go into it with the mindset of like I'm going pro, but it wasn't like a I'm going pro. I need to do this, 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 this. this. Like it just all came like naturally in a sense mm-hmm. where it was like wasn't very forced. Like I had the confidence that I knew that whatever I did was going to work out in the end. So maybe I kind of mix of both, but it, it definitely I definitely came into Valorant thinking like this is this is it. This is my moment. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna shine type I- beat. I like how you say like she had a lot of confidence. That's really funny. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it kind of like do you think it is as like you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds, like not you specifically, but just like that age range of player. Do you think it's like they have confidence because almost like in a degree of ignorance, like they don't know what's yet to come. And so it's like, they just have this unending belief in themselves. Or why do you think, cause I see this all the time where a 17 to a 19 year old has like a, an unreasonable amount of confidence that helps them go forward. But it's like, where the fuck is that coming from? I yeah I could 100% agree with that like I think I didn't I had no idea what was gonna happen at the time because like I had no idea what was ahead of me and I was just like all right let's do this and like going pro is like I don't know well, I mean I'm not saying going pro is the easy part of it but like when you actually are pro and like the the day to day once you actually get into the routine and like the the dream the idyllic version of it in your head starts to fade away there's definitely a lot of like challenges and things that you don't really think of before you are but when you're 18 17 19 you're like oh my god video games like it's it i want to play video games for money like let's do it like yay there's definitely that like maybe like rose tinted glasses for sure but like it drives you right like you you're young like make mistakes when you're young and like a lot of people around you tell that uh, tell you that um like i definitely like when i, I was in college and i like dropped out i i, I mean i had um was it one year and then i withdrew from college so you said like the the idealized or the rose tinted glasses of the pro scene when because I, I see that too where it's definitely not all rainbows and sunshine once you get into it there's a lot of mm. hard work there's you know a lot of tension a lot of fights a lot of late nights a lot of like anxiety and stress and pressure and all those kinds of things and so once you actually make it to the pro scene and you are in that day-to-day lifestyle like you were talking about what does that actually look like so pre-pro you're doing one thing and now you're in the pro scene what does that that lifestyle actually look like so for me recently because i had mentioned to you um, before we started recording that it's we're going to this next uh three months as a team and individually like we're going as hard as possible so for me i've already like even if you compare my schedule now to like last month it's already completely different or there's been some changes not completely different but currently um my schedule is um like i wake up Try to wake up at around like 11, 11.30, and then hit the gym. Practice starts around 2, but I like to be on my PC before then. But it just depends on how long my workout takes. It can be anywhere between like, you know, an hour and a half to two hours. And then I got a shower. So I go to the gym fasted, uh, shower, I get on my computer. Typically, I have around like an hour of free time, and that's what I like to kind of prepare for practice so what that means mm-hmm. for me is the igl which means either i'm like talking to effies like i'm messaging him like what comps you're running today like what what maps are we doing and then i'll watch the vods i'll watch our vods i'll watch other team vods i'll watch comms videos pretty much i'm like getting into like the that's my first exposure to valorant uh in, in the day is around like 1 p.m and then practice starts around two and I, i've also like dm and stuff like that it just depends like that 1 p.m to 2 p.m period is just purely valorant so whether it's like videos <laughs> media podcasts playing the game not playing the game i'm just watching vods instead it can be any of those things it just depends on how the day is and like how i'm feeling and then practice starts and from two to honestly let me actually just check my calendar from two until 9 p.m is how long our practice is and so that it can include between like it, it depends like the first couple hours yeah. it could be like an hour of server time straight into scrims or it could be two hours of server times then a scrim and a break uh, and a, a vod review break and a scrim and a VOD review break. We change up our schedule, but depending on like our needs pretty much. 
but generally speaking we have like two hours of time before we're not even playing the game yet we're doing server time so for people that don't know that means we're in a server and we're like talking about our setups and our strategies on the map and like theory crafting and just overall Effie's is like telling us like you know things that we can try and what we can do differently and then VOD review is when we're watching back our our previous games so we'll watch back like let's say uh Monday is an ascent day we'll watch back our the last time we screamed ascent we'll watch those VODs back and like uh, even if we have watched it, we'll watch it again if it's been a while to like refresh. Like, hey, so remember we made this mistake. This is what we're doing differently. Um, and so we'll do that for um, one to two hours. We'll do like four to five scrims a day with like a uh, if it's five scrims, we'll have a break in between with like a vod and then into a break. And then depending on the day and how hard we're going, if it's close to a tournament, um, we'll probably go a little harder. But at the end of the day, we have like an optional vod review at like 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Where if Epi's thinks that we really need to like discuss things we'll take that time to watch like another vod from that day so practice can always start at two but it can end between 9 or 10 p.m and mm. then around that time i give myself like at least like 20 30 minutes to like eat and stuff like that because roy does uh, he does the cooking in the house so it helps nice. me a lot i can just eat and then i can you know at a different time i can just do the dishes you know what i mean so it's a lot it's, it's it works for our schedule and then i play ranked right after or i'll um well, lately I've been playing more ranked. Um, like I'll have my teammates or something, and we'll just play ranked. And I'll play playing Valorant or doing anything Valorant related until like 2 a.m. I want to say. Um, maybe there's an hour break there after practice. Like if my practice ends at nine, maybe I'll hop on ranked at like 10 instead, and I'll like take time to eat and decomp. And then from 10 to two is like a four-hour, three to four-hour period where um, I'm playing ranked or I'm doing something about the game. So either I'm like water viewing again or I'm, you know theory crafting thinking about setups or i'm watching like comms videos and stuff like that so that's that pretty much and then time. yeah and then from two to three <laughs> is my chore like my night routine so all the chores i got to get out of the way which means doing the dishes that i didn't do i'm setting up my um my oats for the next day like i have protein oats because um i try to take the gym serious and my diet and stuff like that um any chore i shower i shower if i haven't showered like all the night routine and if i have time we'll watch like, an episode of like anime with roy and I try to be asleep by like 4 a.m. So that's my day to day yeah. routine. You and I live absolute opposite schedules. I try yeah. to get all my, my <laughs> like chores, my housework, everything done between like 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. That's that's the sweet Jeez, spot. Jeez, I'm like, a, I'm <laughs> just going to sleep pretty much while you're doing that. That's crazy. My, uh, my like pristine or perfect day is you get up at around like 5 30, 6 make some coffee and then get like three or four ranked games in by like 9 wow. a.m. Like that's 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 the perfect life right there Jeez. i love it <laughs> it's opposite that's actually schedule. very opposite yeah it's crazy um okay that's an intense schedule just in general i know you so the first thing is you mentioned that the first thing you do like the first exposure to valorant is at like 1 p.m give or take and you said that's partly due to your igl responsibilities of watching comms theory crafting watching just vids and or vods in general doing all of these things and I guess my question is for, and kind of like, not so much like giving advice to other potential IGLs, like say like a 17, 18 year old, but kind of like that. But what do you think it is that makes a good IGL? Like are other players on your team doing the same thing? Is this just so that you can hone your leadership skills, your knowledge about the game? Like what is it that actually makes either a good IGL or makes you a good IGL? In Valorant, I think what makes for a good IGL in my opinion, when I look at the vlogs and the commentators of the best IGLs in the world, obviously calling, there's a baseline aspect of like, you need to have a good call. Like you need to have good calls in game. That means good mid rounding, good plans. You're working with your coach, coming up with good comps, but that's like the bare minimum. Like the bare minimum of being a good IGL is having good calls. Like, and even then you can actually, you can actually sacrifice some of your calling capability if you make up for it in, in these other aspects I'm about to mention. But great IGLs, not just good ones, have, you know, good calling and they're a leader outside of the game. So in this aspect, what I was talking about, like, I feel like the leader should, the IGL should have the best work ethic on the team by far. They should be setting the example of like, this is how hard I work. And you know what I mean? Like, uh, like you shouldn't be able to like work harder than me because they are the person that's picking the strategies and everything. So I try to make it a, a point to where I have the best work ethic on any team I'm on. Or at least I very, I very truly do try. And like yeah. I said, that could include hopping an hour before practice and putting in those hours after practice. Like, I know people say like work-life balance, but it is really hard as an IGL. Like I, I'm experiencing that now as someone who's trying to get active. 
I've been going to the gym since March and trying to work out six days a week. I've, I've moved that down to um, five days a week so I can have an extra day off so I can stream more. I can um, keep my form up playing ranked and stuff like that for another night without having to kind of like interrupt it. But that's, that's like a, a one thing is like setting that example outside the game. You'll hear it often. Um, like on these sports psychology podcasts too that I've watched where it's like being a leader of men. So you also need to be there like emotionally for your team. You need to mm -hmm. be that anchor. And uh, it's, it's various from team to team, like what the team needs out of you. Um, every environment is different. There is no, you know, one size fits all. But generally speaking, it's better to have that kind of like calm anchoring presence on a team where you're not the one freaking out. You're not the one asking. You're not, you're not the one confused. Like when I'm making a call in game and I'm like, uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna ca cat split. We're actually gonna fake it and go mid to B. Like, there's a difference between saying it like how I just did and be like, oh, okay, I, I guys, I think we I think we cat split and I, I think we meant to be after. Like, you need to have like some confidence and you need to have like a strong yeah. a strong voice, right? Um, and that's like that confidence carries in outside, uh, inside and outside of the game. So you want to be that kind of confidant as well, where you um, people want to come to you, you're confident and like, you know you sound like you know what you're talking about and your teammates can rely on you to not you know freak out in like high pressure matches and stuff like that because let's say let's say your IGL is getting super nervous in like a high pressure match and it, it is normal to get nervous but I'm seeing like they're shaking like they're quivering like they're they sound nervous and like they're not calling right and like uh, they're missing all the utah like stuff like that when you're in IGL like you have to be that one person that isn't like that even if it sacrifices your own gameplay because you're focusing so much on that because it will help the rest of your team to play better and at the end of the day, like, I think I've seen Sadak say this on loud, but like being a leader is not about you really at all. It's about how you can serve your team. You're serving others. Like that's what a leader really is. And so if serving others means you have to have like worse, you know, gameplay so you can focus on like keeping the energy up and being always the high energy person in the room, which is another thing about IGL. You always need to have high energy. You can't have a single day where you're low energy because it affects everyone. Because again, everyone looks to you to set yep. the example and like how they should be acting and how they should be. So you need to have high energy, you know, be positive, don't get down on your teammates, um, be confident, you know, be that anchor that your team needs if that's what your team requires. Like some teams require, like they want someone that's like, like super high energy, da -da 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 -da. and some people want that low energy, like calm voice, right? And so if these, you know, it, what are the intangibles like these things you can't see on like a on, on a leaderboard or like a stat page is in my mind what makes for like a great IGL and I think um, it's something too like I said earlier being like a confidant for your team where people feel like they can talk to you about hey like I feel like I did this wrong like can I can I do better here one thing I noticed that helps that's helped me a lot in my career and this is not just on version one but also on C9 Magical um, especially it's Cloud9, because Magical I definitely wasn't the best teammate. You need to be a really good teammate. And that means, like, as an IGL, you do need to hold people accountable more so than, like, others, I feel like. So, because you're pushing your vision of the game and your philosophy of how the game should be played. So, for example, like, let's say we're on Bind and someone just wide swing showers no reason or something like that. It's like, hey, you... In, in this setup, we're not. You're, you're in the weak side of the map. We want you to like stay alive and play your life, actually, because the other side on B is making the aggressive play. So you don't need to swing showers here, and you, you need to be the one that's confident, and able to call that out. And your team, that teammate, needs to have that trust in you and that relationship with you to not take that personally and to be like, oh no, like yeah, you're right. You know what I mean? But in order to kind of have that trust, you as the leader need to be able to show fault and weakness as well. So let's say I'm the one swinging showers and. You know, I was not supposed to swing showers and die off rip, but I do. It would be like a good thing for you to be like, hey, like, my bad, guys, I yeah, I, I mean. fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, I messed up here. That, that's on me. Like, being able to like, point out your own mistakes. And then if you don't point out a mistake and someone else points it out, you need to be able to receive it well and yep. not kind of have this ego about it. And like, that's, I feel like, super important as an IGL is, you know, not being um, like resistant to other people's criticisms like receiving them and even pointing out your own so people know that one you're setting the example again i'm coming back to that setting the example a good example a good team a good player a good leader of like hey like you know you're not perfect either you can be criticized even though you kind of make the strats in the game plan like you can still like fuck up and you can mess things up and it's mm. okay and having that and having like a create creating a good like healthy environment for criticism and feedback is also a big part of being an igl in my opinion, trying to keep those egos in check, especially as you get better and better and better, 
because like you see it in like every sport like the, the creme de la crop like the people at the very top are bound to get egos and honestly at the end of the day you get you see these super teams get made and they don't work in across Never, any sport yeah. because of like ego checking and it's so hard to get those egos in check and you need a great coach to do it and i'm not saying it hasn't happened it's just very very difficult and so making sure you can kind of stop that and like nip that in the bud and like being that person like rein everyone in and yourself is another great you know aspect of what i see to be like great igls at least it's what works for me as well I went yeah. on a rant there, but no, there's so good. many that's... <laughs> aspects to IGLing. That's not just I, when did I say anything about the game? Really, I said like maybe ten words about the game. <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. There's a there's a lot to unpack there, and there's a few things that mm -hmm. we're gonna follow up here real quick. But I like the last thing that you said is really interesting. With um, you can build a super team, but they don't work out. That's not Valorant. That's not League. That's pretty much like every every sport, every esport. Build a super league, a super team, and it often will fail. Mm -hmm. And I I. I think that also, and this is tying in the the whole like, ego idea a little bit, but this ties back to what you were saying about IGLs at the very start of that whole tangent of you can actually have not the greatest call, or you can you can be not the greatest caller if you are good at a lot of these other aspects, a lot of these other intangibles, and I think that's that right there is part of the reason why super teams don't work out because you have the best players, you have the best callers, you have the best mechanically gifted people you have all of these things but they lack all of those other intangibles that bind the team together and so then rather than having a team playing together you have five individuals and like you might get a round or two you might get a game or two you might get a series or two but you can't have consistent results with just superstar players that aren't playing together and i think that that like ego superstar ties a lot into that first point you made about an igl not actually having to mm -hmm. have the best calls um which, do, you, do you kind of agree with that, or is... Oh, no, I 100% I agree with that. And I think, too, um, like, people make this... Uh, I feel like people make this comment about Fnatic, and let me be clear, I think Boaster is a great IGL. I also think his calling's really good, and his mid-rounding has been phenomenal this year as well. I think people give Fnatic a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of crap just because they were winning a majority of in the Valorant VCT circuit this year. Um, a lot of the criticisms are, like, outdated or just, like flat out wrong I, I think he's been running is good but especially when you if you do apply that criticism where people think okay like Fnatic's strategy is flat compared to someone like uh Pujon um like FNS on uh NRG but you look at the comms videos and you can hear him getting he's like doing a lot of microing it sounds like and he is getting people together on the same page and it's like where does that show up on the leaderboard or stat? But like, you see him, he's like, okay, mm -hmm. guys, we're going to get on the site. We're going to plant. Hold me. And then he sees no one's holding him. Okay, hold me, guys. And he just makes sure he's like, he's got that voice that everyone can come back to in the middle of a very chaotic round where it's like, Boaster's going to tell me um, X, Y, Z, and we're all going to be on the same page. We're all going to listen. And you can kind of see that in like a team like Fnatic where people have criticized Fnatic for being a team that is like, not um, it's, you don't see such flashy mid rounding as like maybe a team as energy as often as a team like energy but you see them as a super like they are a team team like they have they've won a lot of events this year and they play and placing fourth is like their worst result so you can see that in like a team like Fnatic in my opinion which even though again I think Boaster's mid rounding is is good and I think Fnatic is great I can see how if you compare them to like energy maybe their mid rounding um I, I would I would definitely put that in more Finesse's court it's just just so we're clear I'm not I'm not hating I'm not a Fnatic hater I'm just bringing up a valid point here in Valorant yeah. that we can take well, away I'll, from a I'll leader. I'll tag him in with this, like, one clip. I'll tag him in it just so he sees it. <laughs> um, all right, so let's unpack some of that IGL stuff, and I'm going to miss some of the points. I normally have a, a notebook that I'm writing down. I don't have it today, but you mentioned a little bit about a podcast. Uh, was it, What was that podcast name? Sorry? You, you mentioned a little bit about a podcast where you were talking about. The, oh, I've watched a it? ton of different ones. I couldn't tell you which specific ones. I've watched, like, a lot of um, just like content with IGLs in general. Like I'll try and watch any like media I can get of them talking for an extended period of time about like their team and stuff like that. Like I know Wyatt recently just dropped one with Valen, um, like literally yesterday that like, he recorded a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. He also did one with Stellar, uh, Hunter Thieves Stellar at the beginning of the year. Um, I, I've watched some stuff with Jared Tendler. I've watched um, some stuff with like DDK talking to, even if people aren't necessarily IGLs, even just trying to get like a, a look into like how people work on their teams. But um, I know, like, he talked to Elise, uh, Edgar Timlin talked to Elise about some things. I don't know if that was a podcast or if it was a, an article. I just try to get my hands on everything. I couldn't name a specific one. But yeah, there's, you, there's you a lot of content out there. <laughs> you mentioned one. I think it was, like, Leader of Men or something? Oh, no, no, no. I was saying that you oh. hear it uh, often on podcasts. Of, gotcha. Like, okay. Of guys. <laughs> but uh, it's not even just uh, tied to yeah. Valorant. 
like it's not just Valorant podcast. Like I try to like I one thing I realized I think it was um is that one guy uh, Magnus uh, Magnus Carlson he was on an interview with that one guy that has a really popular podcast not Joe Rogan the the guy that wears the suit. Lex. Lex yeah, Friedman. he was yeah, yeah like, so like some Lex Friedman po- uh, Friedman podcasts and like even not just Valorant related, even people like Magnus Carlson and like leaders in other sports and even like Michael Jordan interviews, like even like the really obvious ones like Kobe Bryant and stuff like that. Because really, yeah, like at the one percent of the one percent of a lot of sports, competition kind of competition psychology is roughly the same. Like it's the same yep. narrative. It's the same things. I'll, I find myself relating to a lot of the things that they say and like they feel and like the things that they talk about. Because again. When I gave you all those things about being a leader, I only said 10 words about the game. <laughs> Everything else was completely irrelevant. And those things are like commonalities that you find across several dis- different sports, esports, tennis, basketball, volleyball, like football, and Valorant. Like a lot of it really comes together at the very top when we're talking purely about um, like leadership, I feel like. And then obviously the calling, but that that's a whole other aspect. You can be a really good yeah. caller and like an awful IGL, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think a lot of again whether you look at like music business sport esport it really do- it was, chess is a really good example like it mm-hmm. really doesn't matter what you are doing the principles behind it are often the same when it comes mm-hmm. to whether it's like learning competing being a leader being a good teammate all of these things are pretty like i don't know the same across the 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 board i suppose and I, being able to like watch a sports psych podcast, sports science podcast, uh, Magnus Carlson, MJ, mm-hmm. um, another another really good one to just kind of like keep in mind is like Michael Phelps has a lot of golden oh, really? nuggets of advice as well. Like mm-hmm. he he has some phenomenal advice on different things. But um, I guess with with the idea of becoming a leader and watching podcasts, was it that you started watching these podcasts and then that turned you into a good leader as a byproduct of it? Or was it more of like you had a hunger to be a good IGL, a good leader, and then so you went out seeking the answers? What was the what was like the origin of this? Hmm. I think it was the latter. I, I definitely have just been interested in this kind of stuff like since Magical, and I've just like, continued to just follow up on it. This isn't like a recent uh, progression. It's been a thing ever since I started IGLing because I I knew I wanted to you know like be a leader and I wanted to get better at it, and I knew I wasn't perfect and I wasn't good, and it was gonna be like a a thing but it's funny because like you can actually it's actually i would highly recommend like you know consuming as much media about being a leader as you can like podcasts books etc you know um or just improving yourself as a, as a person and a teammate but at the end of the day i think what actually helped me the most was like having that information like you know passively accumulating it over the years like talking to like you know people like yourself um it's not like it was like a weekly thing i was just trying to absorb as much as I, information as i could but really what helped me the most i feel like was going through it and just getting that experience raw you know with that information in mind so yep. even like you know berlin last year was a huge turning point for me as a leader because losing that was like a huge you know moment in my career and being able to like reflect on that and kind of like think it through and just go through that experience like experience will get you very far and teach you a lot of these lessons directly because you can i can watch as many podcasts as possible and be like oh yeah like you're right but when i'm actually <laughs> in that position i'm like damn you was right like i went through that and that was real you know yep. I, I i'm putting it very like abstract and i'm not using any specific wording here but that's at no, least no. what helped me the most was actually getting the experience through these couple years i've been professional and leading yeah, teams no, i think that's this exactly it like you can have the way i described a lot of people like you can have all of the information in the world i can give you like whatever words you need to hear you can have whatever it is like you can hear all of the theory all of the concepts Mm -hmm. but until you actually experience that moment those words often mean nothing Mm -hmm. but if you set yourself up and like you consume that knowledge it'll kind of like sit there dormantly in your in your brain and then you have this tragic moment you have this hype moment you go through this terrible moment like all of these things happen and like that information finally makes sense because you can relate it to experience it's no longer just like theoretical concepts Mm -hmm. it's theoretical concepts that are tied to something that i have experienced and i think that's that's what a lot of people or a lot of players and coaches miss sometimes is they want the magic words that solve stuff but they're not prepared to go out and get the experience necessary to turn those magic words into something that's actually like practical and applied within their whether right. it's IGLing, playing, coaching, whatever it might be. And um, yeah, that just makes a lot of sense. With I wanted to because I'm gonna forget this. So I want to touch on it. I know mm-hmm. I know you mentioned that I can't remember the words you used. Something about last year, something bad happening or some loss. Is 
is that talking about like Berlin? Is it talking about C9 dissolving as a team and then how that changed you as a player? What was it that having that disruptive event or what was that event? And then what was the, the having that disruptive event, what made that cause or that change happen in you? I think that uh, the event was like losing Berlin and the events that happened after. Like that's all like one big thing to me where like leading up to Berlin, losing it and then the team dissolving and then within a week of losing it of losing berlin i had to like i literally found a new team and that was like you know saying goodbye to like you know some players i'd played with for years the only players i'd played with the only teammates i've had for years um was all it all happened within a week within a week within like the time of seven to ten days essentially so that that, that period is definitely the one i reflect on like the one i've reflect on the most and that's made the biggest change uh, on me as like a player in a career just like uh in the shortest amount of time and it just made me think about uh, so much like there's honestly so much i could get into um some of it was more personal like with the team that i'd rather keep with the team but yeah, I, I took away a lot of things about how i could have been a better leader and how i could have been a, b a better player in in the month leading up to berlin in berlin and how i can be a better person for like for my current team um not better person in terms of like i was evil or anything like that like just a better like a better like handling things because in mm -hmm. berlin um like i was uh, alluding to earlier like the pressure was a lot and it definitely got to me to a point where i had to have like an emergency meeting with a sports psychologist um like a night or two before we had a big game or uh yeah we had lost in g2 i had the meeting and then um then we lost at, uh, against sr you guys but i did have like a, a meeting with a guy i'd never talked to before and i had because i had to talk to somebody mm -hmm. and it was just really hard for me and so losing most of it has been more towards how i deal with pressure i don't really feel pressure as much anymore i get nervous for sure um, like anyone does during like big matches, but the pressure I'd felt in Berlin was like unlike anything I had ever experienced in all honesty, because we were like the team that was meant to like win it. And then me specifically, I was like, you know, I was just talking, I was viewed as like, you know, someone that was like really good at the game as an IGL. I was very outspoken, very public facing figure. But now it's like, I am still those things. I am still a very public facing uh, figure. I am still the IGL. Um, some people would say like the face of game changers and stuff like that. But nowadays I don't let it um, really affect me as much, if at all. So for me, it's been able to like kind of shift the direction of that pressure into like, uh, it's pushed into nothing. I, it's kind of it's kind of weird because people it's gone it's, it's gone to a point where people say negative things, right? Which are, don't get to me anymore. But as well as people say positive things, it also doesn't get to me anymore because I'm just okay. like here, which is weird. Yeah. I, which kind of sucks in a way because it's like oh yeah. like you know. I kind of lack on the positive things, which I think I can do a better job of doing. Like, hey, mm -hmm. just because you're not trying to get affected by anything doesn't mean you can't, you know, accept some of the nice things people <laughs> say about you. But yeah. at the time, like I was telling, saying earlier, those nice things made it harder for me because I felt like there's a lot of pressure on me to like live up to those really nice things that people were saying about me, like, you know, face of game changers and stuff like that. But me kind of like, I don't know, um, like blurring it out just helps me just exist as a person. Because I, I don't know, like I'm not... A, I'm not a fucking doctor. I don't, I don't work on brains. I'm just sitting here playing a video game. And so that's how I try to view things mostly. <laughs> Nowadays, ever since Berlin, I try to be like, dude, it's a video game. Because I yeah. Berlin was so trauma. It was like traumatizing almost. Like I was crying. I was super emotional. But I'm like, dude, this is a game. Like I, it was never this deep to begin with. I just let me just have fun. And then you, you see like teams at, um, at champs. Like you see evil geniuses in Paper Rex. And all they talk about the entire tournament, the entire three weeks, you know, of the tournament. And then the weeks leading up to it is, hey, we're just here to have fun, bro. We're just here to have fun. You just yep. hear it constantly. The, the best teams right now in the world that were playing the best were like, hey, we're, we're having fun. Honestly, I'm just here with my boys. We're having fun. And so I just try to view it like that. I'm not some big figure and I'm just here to have fun. And so that was my biggest lesson from Berlin was it's not that deep. You're a video gamer. Just have fun. <laughs> That's a, I don't know if you've gotten into like stoic philosophy at all, but that line is, it's not that big of a deal is like a very like stoic yeah. premise where it's just like, <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I could step outside my apartment right now and I could get run over by a bus. Like there's much worse things that could happen than losing this video game. So that's mm -hmm. interesting because I know you said like that event or like that bad event. That's I guess it'd be like a series that ten days, seven to ten days, changed the way that you experience pressure from it was being overwhelming to now it's the the, the stress is there or whatever, but it's not like all mm -hmm. consuming. And I think it's almost like that catalyst that bad event a lot of times can crack a player it can break them where 
they go through their career winning or succeeding constantly and then something bad happens, pushes them down, and it's very hard for a player to get back up oftentimes so they haven't learned that skill set yet. And I would wager that because you've spent the time watching podcasts, doing your research, um, talking with people, learning about the sports psych, the performance sciences, all those types of things, that was probably one of the things that enabled you to take this traumatic event and turn it or help help it turn you into a better version of yourself. So it's like, mm-hmm. though you were a good IGL then, it created you into even a better IGL now. But I would say it's probably a lot due to the the amount of reading and listening and learning that you were doing previous to that that allowed you to go through that moment and actually come out thriving at the other end. Yeah, I I understand. I agree with that take. I understand. I agree with your assessment. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, with with making that transition, so that trauma- not to not not to poke at that one thing too much. I'm very no, curious. Good, like going from C9 to V1, you went from a team that was constantly winning to a team that was constantly winning. So it's like both both successes are are very large at both cases. But I'm curious on from a team where you had I, I know. Lexi is still with you, but you have two different team cultures, two different environments, two different organizations, two different whatever you want to throw in there. How do you as a leader go from one organization having a very successful and thriving team to then jumping into a new organization, rebuilding a new culture, rebuilding team structures, rebuilding, um, you mentioned the word accountability earlier that I want to touch on as well, but like building in those accountability, how do you actually go from one team to a new team and actually make sure that that team has the good culture the good expectations the good everything it was definitely a challenge it's very different at first but i would say it was oddly and not to say it wasn't like it wasn't challenging but it was oddly easier to do that this this time with version one than it was with the the cloud nine because i mean when i when we were on magical i knew nothing nothing about competing nothing about anything in the world i was just like 19 years old like Pretty much, pretty much a teenager just playing yep. games. I didn't know anything about like, inter- like personal dynamics and stuff like that. Like I used to think I was good with people, but at the time I was like not the best teammate. Like I, I will be the first one to tell you that. And so going, it took me years. You know what I mean? I we did we did win a lot, but like to actually get to where I wanted to be as a person and a player, it took me like a long time. Uh, on Magical and C9, but with version one, I feel like I had already learned all those lessons, and it kind of felt like. Cloud9 and Magical, like, when I first started with version 1, it felt like the, the tutorial phase of my career was finally over, and I could just, like, fly, and I could cool. just be like, wow, okay, I have all the tools now that I need, and I have everything that everything that I could know. Like, I mean, I don't know everything, everything. Obviously, there's so much more from experience, but, like, I feel like I have the base tools now, and I have, you know, like, the baseline knowledge that I need to actually, like, do this, and, like, do it right, and... It was easier actually having that had ex, that experience of being on C9 and Magical for two years and bringing that over everything I had learned with version one. Because, you know, with me and Lexi, I was looking at my, my new teammates, you know, Nicole Fluorescent and Sarah, and I was like, damn, like, they're, they're, they are they're me, but a few years ago. And I feel like I can kind of be someone that's kind of like a mentor. I can be someone that can help them and give, you know, help them from what I was, uh, what I learned and give them that kind of knowledge and that experience and so it was actually easier this time around kind of integrating like the, the systems that i wanted and also bringing effies effies was a huge huge part and a huge um huge deal in making the team it is today because as you were saying like accountability is a big one and he is a he has a very like specific way he wants to play the game and he has a strong voice and he knows what he's talking about and he has everyone's respect and every and so as a result everyone buys in to everything that we do like all the systems and you know, the, the roles that we have and like any changes we make to comps or any changes we make to maps or how we approach maps and um, how we criticize each other and how we like every everyone buys in. And it's been a lot. It's been a lot easier this time around than on C9 and Magical just because I had no idea what I was doing <laughs> on, on those teams, really, until like until towards like the end when I was actually like a year or two into my career. So it's, it's been really fire. nice. I've been enjoying it. <laughs> Obviously, there are challenges, you know, working with like, younger players, but I would say it's it's very different because again there is kind of like a hierarchy in a sense there's an experience hierarchy rather in a sense because me and Lexi have just had more experience than the rest of them but they know and they're really really willing to learn and um, take away from our experiences versus on C9 and Magical it was very much like there was no hierarchy everyone was equal because we all came from the bottom together yeah and I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing I'm just pointing out the differences yeah. in the dynamic and so it's been easy for me to implement you know what I want to implement just because of the experience I have. Sorry, it was a long-winded answer to say that, but no, I like a long-winded, long-winded answers, and I think, I think that's true. Like you said, 
neither way is like correct or better than the other but each has their time and place and i think this is again kind of touching on something you were talking about earlier with um like what's the right way to do a team or what's the right way to be an igl and it's different for every every team every environment every individual and same kind of goes for this like some teams you need a structured hierarchy where it's like coach gets to say igl gets to say and then everybody else is kind of following along and other teams it's like everybody it's a full democracy and everybody's putting their input and i don't at least my personal opinion i know that like if we were to dive into research that might say something different but from my personal opinion like there's no correct way to build a team it's here's the pieces that we have and here's the the infrastructure that we can build that will make these five individuals plus their coach thrive and like there's no cookie cutter approach to that so mm-hmm. it's cool to see the difference between say like magical all the way up to v1 and how things have changed for for you mm-hmm. and this is actually something <laughs> this is going to be a repeat from my last conversation i had um and this is also something that sean garris and i were talking about once where when you are 17 to 19 give or take you have that sense of unearned confidence i shouldn't say unearned because that's not a good way of saying it you aren't you have like th- this really deep confidence in yourself and it allows you to push limits that somebody who's older wouldn't push because you aren't mm-hmm. really comprehending or contemplating all of the possible negative outcomes because you haven't done the reps yet so it's like your 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 mind is almost unlocked with like i can do this or i'm gonna go do this or i'm gonna try this yeah, you exactly. end up like breaking the meta or breaking the way that the game is played but if you do that too much you end up just having very chaotic teams and like unstructured practice and people don't really make progress that well then you Mm -hmm. tack on somebody who has a little bit more experience who has gone through hardship who's gone through successes they have a higher degree of stability so they can create like the parameters of the team while the younger players can push the limits and like together you have the stability with the unhinged innovation and like i think when you can build a team that combines those two things really really well now you have a superstar roster that actually works well together if you have all unhinged players you end up mm-hmm. not performing well if you have all stable players you end up becoming very predictable exactly. merge those two together and you have innovation at least that's the way that i see it no that makes total sense and it's funny too because i was saying how superstar teams often don't work unless you have like a- an ego check but like my team is kind of like word on the street jokes were that we are like a super team in the sense of like we got like the best duelist and then uh, like the best senti and like the like pretty much like the best aimers in like the in the scene pretty much so funny enough like when you when i brought up super team it's like okay well my team technically is a super team but the difference is that you know we have um we have a good accountability system and there are no egos and i think that also ties into why it has felt a lot easier to do this is because like you said like having those younger players would be like a little unhinged but they're only unhinged in terms of like you know the game and even now, like, yeah, it's been, yeah. we've been together nine months, so we, we're pretty in tune with each other, and we're That's all good. pretty experienced at this point. But what actually really helped, I think, the most was the fact that they surprisingly did not have any egos. That's cool. At all to deal with. Like, they were all very receptive of feedback. They weren't ego checking or anything, or just, like, it was such a pleasure to work with. This is not having any of that. It was such a breath of fresh air having that. And I was like, dude, this is kind of crazy that they're, like, listening and, like, Obviously, I, I can make mistakes, and they aren't gonna har- they aren't gonna harp me for it. And no one had any egos, so I think that was also a huge part of me transitioning from C nine and bringing what I thought was a winning formula to version one and then applying it there was the fact that the players had zero egos, like they were so willing to do anything or whatever and fix on any mistakes and stuff like that. Sorry, I just wanted to touch on that because I was talking about super teams and ego checking, but like this team is I think I guess it's unique. And if there yeah. are any egos, like F's is like you know at the end of the day he, there is a hierarchy where he's the coach and we all listen to him. So. Yeah. So here, here's a question on ego, and I, I don't even know how I'm going to ask this question because I don't even know what the question is. So this might be a little bit bumpy, so bear with me. Yeah, you're good. If you have, obviously not the players in your team, but if you have, say, hypothetically, a 17-year-old player who does have an ego, what would your advice be for them becoming aware and resolving that ego? Because I think for a lot of younger players, they don't necessarily know that they have an ego. Like, they play the game, they don't feel like they have an ego it might be clear to people outside them, but they don't see it. So what would your advice be for, or what, what's your thoughts around how do you become aware of your own ego? And then how do you go about resolving your ego so you maintain confidence, but you still are open to suggestions and feedback and critique and those types of things? Mm-hmm. I'm let me think. I think, first of all, like, ego is actually a very healthy thing to have. And it's something that you need to have as a competitor because you do need to have that sense of like, I'm going to beat you when you play someone else in a competition. Like when you play on their team, 
you need to believe in yourself. You need to have that ego, like, hey, I'm better than this. I'm better than this team. Like, you know, you have to be able to win, <laughs> obviously, like for sure. But only time when ego becomes like an issue is like when you have it towards like your teammates. So my advice would be, I'm trying to think if I was a jet player and I was 17, if I was an IGL, like again, you're just trying to get the strengths and the best out of your players. And my strength would, in this case, is like, okay, it's a good thing that they have an ego because they're rolling over everyone, taking every <laughs> aim duel. But I think uh, like if I was an IGL in this situation, I'd be talking to me and the coach. And a lot of it would rely, like a lot of it stands in the balance of do they buy into the coaching and the coaching staff and the IGL? Because if they don't buy into that, it's going to be a flop. Like if they don't trust the IGL and the coach and they're egoing the coach, and the, you, you might as well find someone else. I'm not even joking. I'd rather have mm. a, a worse player um, at the role, but they're willing to take criticism and uh, not have an ego towards their teammates than someone that is an insane jet player, but they have a huge ego. They don't take advice and stuff like that. So a lot of it would be how willing, um, how they would react like the coaching staff and the IGL talking to them. And then I guess if I was still in that situation, I would be like, dude, listen, like you are insane. Like we want to leverage you and I, we all want to win together. And I think the best chance of us winning is if we work together and we're here to set you up and like a system revolves around you popping off. Like we are building a system around you, but there are some things where if we want to have a higher chance of winning and like a consistent win condition, you need to do this differently. We aren't shutting you down though. Don't get it wrong. Like we want you to play like insane. We want to set you up for these things, but you need to let us set you up for success and you aren't. And I think that's how I would approach it, at least from my, if I was in that situation. Yeah, very cool. You actually, you touched on a, a, this concept or this graph that I reference a lot. Do you ever watch any of Simon Sinek's, uh, his content? Uh, I can't, I don't think so. I've never heard of it. I'll send it to you after we're done here, but he, he touches on this point with, where he's talking about the military and uh, I think it's like, I think he was talking specifically about the Navy SEALs and what he goes into was when he was working with them, he asked, how do you choose which people become SEAL Team 6 or which people or how do you choose the people that actually become the SEALs because there's a lot of talent out there. How do you actually go down about narrowing that? And he's he said that the response was a little bit shocking to him where they have like a, a comparison or a chart that they run between performance and trust. And he this is a little bit hard to explain without having the graph or like showing up on screen. Maybe I'll put it up there. Mm -hmm. But you can have a very, very high performer, best of the best, like most athletic, most fit, strongest, whatever it is. You can have the highest performer possible who is very low on trust. So like he doesn't trust his team. The team doesn't trust him. They don't get along. And it's very difficult to have somebody like that on your team. And so what they'll actually do is they'll prioritize somebody that has, they might be like lower on the performance scale, but very high on the trust scale. Like they yeah. will be there for you no matter what. They've got the right attitude. They will put your life before their own. They're there for the team. Even if they're not as fit or as sharp or as smart or whatever it is, like they still have to meet that base threshold, of course, but they are a, a lower performer but because they're higher on trust, it's like they fit better and we will operate yeah. as a unit better because we trust them, they trust us, and we are a unit, whereas the high performer, like I think that's kind of where the superstar rosters sometimes come in is if mm -hmm. they are a high performer, but they don't, you don't trust them or you can't be, they can't be accountable to the team, then like it doesn't matter how good they are, they will still make the team crumble. So it's interesting to bring exactly. up that point of if you have a star player or a star duelist, like if, if they are low on that, we'll call it the trust metric right now, if they are low on that trust metric, it's probably time to get rid of them, even though they're a high performer. And that's like, mm. I don't think that's an insight that most people have, but I think I would 100% agree with you on it. Mm -hmm. And like most times, at least at like the highest level, like they're people with egos and they do work on it. Like it is like a thing that's worked on for years. So the, a lot of them are malleable and a lot of them do, are there are, they are willing to, you know, change and work on it. But at least if I was like someone in that position, 100%, I agree with you. Like it, I would take the person that has like more buy-in and trust in, like the systems than someone that is technically better in every other regard just purely because like i mean i've i've just feel like i've i've, I've lived it and it's just not it's not it's not it it's definitely not it <laughs> yeah fair enough uh you you've mentioned the word in, in your explanation of the ego and i think a few times before you kept on mentioning or you mentioned a few times the word like building the systems when you say that like and I guess that's kind of like building the team process, the team infrastructure, the team systems, and trying to make sure everybody has buy-in to that system. What does like a system actually mean to you? Or like when you're looking at a high-performance team, what are you trying to build, and how does that look like? 
it can vary between like in game structure and like out of game structure. Like it can be a simple, uh, something as simple as like how we conduct ourselves during VOD review. Like how do we want to, like how do we even want a VOD review in the first place? Are we reviewing these rounds and we're talking about like comms and how we like speak to each other? Like that's one that's that could even in itself be like a system or a system in game would be like okay how would we want to. Uh, how do we want to play this map? Do we want to play this map standard, like uh, meta comp, like uh, let's say Ascent, for example. Ascent, do you want to do like Chaos Sova, Killjoy, Omen, and Jet? You want to go super simple? Okay, then how do we want to take a main control in this comp? Okay, once we have a main control, do we want to limit test? Do we want to like start poking out a main? Or do we not want to take a main control first? Do we want to actually mid default first on this map on the first uh, first half of the gun rounds? Do we want to like, prioritize these ults over these ults? Like that's kind of like what it, I think as it pertains to like in game stuff. And out of game, like I said, it can be like something as simple as. Um, how we talk to each other and how we conduct ourselves during VOD review or when we're boot camping, like this is how we're going to meet and like uh, meet as a team. We're going to do this VOD and then we're going to go over here. We're going to eat and we're going to do this and we're going to talk to each other about it. We're going to go back and do X, Y, Z. Or it could even be something as simple as like, how does our scrim schedule look? Like, okay, guys, this is the, in my opinion, this is how we did it here. And actually I heard this team is doing it this way and we could do it that way as well. Like we could try with, uh, integrating this instead. Okay, we're gonna do two server, we're gonna do two hours two hour server time, uh, two scrims, a break, and then two scrims. No, I actually, we, we should do um, an hour server time, four scrims, break, VOD review. Like it, there's like even stuff like that. Um, and then they could, it could even vary to stuff like, okay, how, how far do you want to set up floor? Um, for example, and like, at what point does floor like fall back? Okay, you get your two, you want us to don't fall back. You, our system is like, we, you do not go for more. Do you know what I mean? Like, it could be like, it's so vague because it covers yeah. such a wide array of, of different things. And I guess it's that, that's what I mean. And I could even think of like better examples if I were to like sit here and think about it. But <laughs> it's just like everything that like you wouldn't really think about mm -hmm. is thought about pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> No, I or like, even just I like stuff like one on ones, like okay, we want to coach, and then you want to have one on ones later with the coach. Or it's like okay, we lose, we lose a, we lose a match. How do we want to do it? Do you want to talk about it as a team right after? Or do we want to talk about it at VOD review? Like we give it a break, everyone leaves, we go into the next day, and we talk about it as a group. Do we want the coach to just bring everyone in for one on ones after we lose the match, and then we talk about it as a group? Stuff like that is like super nuanced stuff that no one like the technical stuff behind the scenes yeah. stuff that people don't really discuss or think about. Yeah. Well, I think I think like that idea of a system or a process is what allows a team to thrive as a whole. Because I can come and do some coaching. A Val coach can come and do some coaching. Like all these things, you can just do these coaching principles. But again, this is kind of like having knowledge that's that doesn't really have any applicable value or doesn't have any practical value. And mm -hmm. I think like that coaching is great. It creates that information. It creates that knowledge. But what you really need is a team that is has an, an agreed upon set of rules or processes. So it's like, this is how we handle conflict. This is how we handle laws. Yeah. This is how we handle um, uh, training, or this is how we handle conversation between each other. This is how we handle whatever it is. And like you actually have almost like your rules of engagement planned out because then everything kind of goes in line and you actually get effective practice or effective learning out of it because everybody's operating on the same principles. And without that, it's very hard for a team to move forward. So that's, that's really cool uh, to hear. I have... I have one more question, and then uh, we can probably start wrapping up because I know we're probably coming up to an hour now at this point. I'm not really sure, but um, I'm very curious about coaching in general uh, from your perspective because mm -hmm. you mentioned Epi's, you mentioned the hierarchy, you've mentioned previous, uh, like what was like in C9, but from your perspective, what is it that you mentioned that Epi's has good buy-in? And this isn't necessarily just specifically for him, but what do you think creates buy-in towards a coach so we can think about any hypothetical coach it could be in any environment but what do you think makes a good coach and what do you think makes players actually go like oh shit i need to listen to this guy or because like they know what they're talking about mm -hmm. i've worked with a ton of coaches like on you know cloud nine we went through like a lot of them and i can say after working with effies what in my mind makes a really good coach is someone that can like command that respect and command that buy-in and i'm not saying effie's is coming on on discord every day saying yeah that's right I, show I, me I the respect play. i was in reykjavik <laughs> show me some fucking respect i'm the coach around here it's not nothing it's yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing like that it's more like you, it's a vibe every, right it's, it's a vibe like he is the head coach like he's uh like alpha he's alpha up and he makes like executive decisions in like every sense i i can say this working in the past and these coaches i've worked with by the way are completely different now i'm sure like it's been nine months ten months even longer for some coaches mm -hmm. since I've worked with them early on and they left cloud nine and then we had new coaches, but like a lot of the coaches I work with on C9, I love all of them, by the way, I appreciate every moment working with them. We're not head coaches except for like dream and dream was a head coach that was like, um, 
Like, he was a head coach, but he didn't have the buy-in from certain players in the team, so it didn't end up working. Again, like, at the end of the day, it's that buy-in. Like, yep. if it goes both ways. Like, obviously, I think a coach can be great, but if the players also aren't showing that same energy to, you know, actually, like, trust them and to respect them, it's never going to work. But anyway, for Effie, he's, like, a head coach in every sense of the word. Like, he will make the executive decisions. He has a... Specifically, who wants to play the game? Like, in Vaudreview, if we're... Obviously, I'm not saying he says it like this, but as an extreme example... He's not a. Uh, he's not like. Um, I think, uh, Mel. I I think you're calling. I think you had a mistake. I don't think this was the best call actually. I, I think you could have done this better. I don't know though. Like this. I think you. I I just. I, I feel like you could do it better. He's not like that. He's like Mel. Um, your call here. I, I disagree with it. Um, open a conversation. Obviously, open okay. to dialogue. But here, I think like you actually pulled them towards A instead of away from A. And so when when you ended A, there was a stack there. Like I think this was not a good call. And like obviously, there's room. There's the floor is open for. Um, like I can explain my thought, my reasoning, and like what I thought was right, and like, well, how we could have a dialogue about it. Obviously, he's not like that much of like a strict ruler, but mm -hmm. he will say things confidently because he has a vision for the game and how he wants to play. Or he'll be like, "Floor, you got us two. Don't go for the third one. Stop going for the third one." You know what I mean? And if he's like, if if we keep making a mistake, he will put his foot down and be like, "Guys, we've talked about this. Like, let's take this seriously now. Like, get the energy up. You guys are playing like ass right now. Like." They'll pause the scrim if we have bad energy. Like, guys, like, wake up. Like, seriously, this you guys are playing a video game. Like, you guys need to wake up and take this seriously. We don't have that many practice before the tournament. Blah, 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 blah. Like, he's willing to, like, be the bad guy in, like, those situations. When previously, working with other coaches, they would rather shy away and not people please, but they, they don't want to step on anyone's toes. But as a coach, okay. you've got to take that jump and that risk. And, you know, you take that knowing that the players likely respect you and trust you. And if they don't, then oh well. Like, that's not the right team for you. Does that make sense? But um, yeah. yeah, I feel like okay. a lot of the coaches I've worked with just didn't have that, like, alpha energy and commanded that respect from the team and that trust from the team. And obviously, with Epi specifically, this is his first coaching gig, but everyone on the team has a lot of respect for him and um, the things he says in his takeaways and how he reads the game because he has been a pro player. He's been at the tier one. He's played at Reykjavik. He's played at the first ever international land that Valorant's ever hosted. And he was literally a player, like, last year. So, yeah. and he's worked with a bunch of different personalities and a bunch of different people and a bunch of different coaches as well. So he's very experienced. And so that's another huge reason, a uh, huge reason why uh, it makes him a great coach. And obviously I collaborate with him a lot. Like him and I have a good relationship. Like we can talk about the game and stuff like that for like a long time. And we see eye to eye on like a ton of things. So that also is like a natural fit in terms of like, I like how he wants to play the game. I also want to play the game like that. So that's also a good fit. Gotcha. Very cool. So one of the things I heard there was that he he is very like doesn't beat around the bush. Is very blunt yep. and upfront, yep. but does it in a way that still invites dialogue and questions and room for explanation and stuff like that. So he doesn't shy away from things, but he also gives you the platform, the ability to also challenge him back or speak your mind as well. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Exactly. And I think he he just has the like he has the confidence in himself to implement you know, the systems that we were talking about and like the systems in game specifically, like uh, the Very coaches cool. I worked with before just did not have that energy or command that respect from some players on the team. And so they never ended up trusting the coach. And so if some people trust the coach, some people don't, the coach doesn't feel like they can do anything. And so there was one point at Cena where we had three coaches, three of them, and none of them had that like head coach and no one really bought it. And this is like at peak Berlin as well. So it was like <laughs> very annoying because there's so many cooks in the kitchen, but none of y'all the head chef. Do you know what you I mean? And that's including me and the team, by the way. Like none of us. It was just like we could not be on the same page about anything. Uh, so it was just... I, didn't, I thought you guys only had two at Berlin. No, we had uh, Moon, Vapen, and Vexel. Again, love them oh, all yeah, to yeah, death. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love them all to death. But like it was like we had like it, it just wasn't. It That's doesn't work out, books. whether because if it was them or the team. And I, in my opinion, it was both ways. Like, I'm, by the way, on Cloud9, not blaming the coaches here. Like, this, we as players did not do our best to set up the coaches for success either. I will be 100% transparent and clear about that. Um, on C9, we definitely didn't. And that was a failure on, like, everyone's part and everyone's parties. But I can confidently stand version one now. Like, I'm very happy with the coach to player to, uh, to IGL process um, and system that we have now. That's awesome. So I would guess that, like... You just said that like it is full transparency, part of the player's fault that C9 yep. went whatever it did. Yeah. And because you see that there was issues with the way that the players were acting, I'm assuming that's part of the thing that gave you the skill, the knowledge, or experience to come to V1 yeah. and be like, this is how we got to do things because 
in the yes. past we did this way and the players it just didn't work out we didn't respect coaches coaches didn't respect us or whatever it looked like and so i'm assuming that was part of the reason why v1 is able to thrive exactly like ha having when we were looking for coaches because we trialed for a bunch of different coaches for version one and i would give my input obviously um when we were having like these team talks with what coach and i was saying we really want to have someone with an active voice someone with an mm -hmm. active voice not someone that is passive and willing to just say things and like let it play out someone that is willing to take that you know take control of situations take control of the game take control of like um team talks and stuff like that and lead discussions like that's someone that we need someone with an act who's going to take an active role in the team and not just say things say some analysis say some like yeah like you can you can have a coach that has great ideas about the game but are they a head coach no i've worked with plenty of coaches that have great minds for the game but have not exuded that like head coach energy which comes a lot down to like personal interpersonal yeah. dynamics and talking to people so definitely looking for someone that has that active role <laughs> do you do you think that's something that just comes naturally to a person or do you think that's something that you can learn over time but doing like what you did for igl like studying the tapes listening to podcasts listening to other coaches like do you think that's something that, uh, thinking of like hypothetically like an 18 year old that wants to be a coach do you think that they just have to have that or can they actually go out and learn it I think a lot of I think few things are innate. I think a lot of things are learned. And I think for Effie's, although it is his first experience coaching, I think he learned a lot from working with a lot of coaches because Effie's is like thirty or thirty one or something. So he's had a long career in like playing in CSGO and Valorant at this point where he's worked with plenty of players, dealt with ego issues in some way, was an IGL at some point as well himself, and also working with coaches brought him a lot of insight and he could kind of take away from those experiences and bring it to coaching and like an 18, I, honestly, as an 18 year old trying to coach, I can see that being very difficult. Like yeah. they're gonna have to really catch up on the podcast sure. and get that yeah. experience because like I said, Effie's is 30 and he, or 30 something, and he got all of that experience raw. So <laughs> I think that's what made him, you know, such a good fit for us. You know, so good luck a... to the 18 year old out there trying to coach. Like you're gonna right? have to, yeah, I believe in you, but you'll have to learn. <laughs> and that's yeah. a good thing though. Like, that's the thing that it's a good, in, in my eyes, it's a good thing that a lot of things aren't innate because you can always learn them. Although it might be a yeah. challenge, you can you can learn pretty much anything you want in this world. You know what's a fun thing about understanding that skill or knowledge or expertise is not innate is the fact yep. that like, think about me as a coach or you as a player, if we believe that we have the potential to get better, the version of us right now is the worst it'll ever be. Which is like, to me, that's a very exciting thought because that means like, because mm. I have the ability to get better, because I know I will put in the work and like go learn, go get experience, talk to new people, who I am right now is, though it's better than who I was a year ago, is the worst version compared to me in a year from now. And I think, like, mm -hmm. to me, that's a very motivating thought because it, it shows that you will always be growing because skill isn't innate. It's something you learn over time. And I think exactly. that's, like, it makes me really excited. Um, I had one last follow-up on it. I can't remember what it was, so... Oh, actually, last one. So when it comes to, I've really wanted to touch on this one since the beginning, but when it comes to accountability, we keep on brushing back to that. Like it was mentioned at the start, it was mentioned with Effie, it was mentioned with um, other players or like 18 year olds checking their ego. Like accountability has been a theme within this conversation, I would say. And so how does a team go about creating that accountability? Like, what does that actually mean? Is it just that like people are calling each other out? Is it that it's like a personal decision of like, I just have to do the right work? Like, what does, what does accountability actually look like and how do you create that within a team? I can only really talk from my perspective because I've only ever been an IGL, but as like a leader, it has helped a lot being the person that sets the tone and like leads by example by calling out your own mistakes and, um, calling others out but in a way where you can read the room like it takes mm -hmm. time but every team is different every person is different like some people on the team prefer to be blunt like they want you to be mean to them <laughs> like, and some people are like hey like don't be so mean to me you know what i mean like say it yeah, yeah. in a nice way where i know you still respect me but like you know and, at least for nicole specifically nicole has literally told me no be mean to me like if i'm doing xyz call me out and be like just wake up like wake the fuck up and jazzy's actually one of those people too i remember when i played with jazzy she was like yeah if i'm not playing well just tell me to wake the fuck up just like scream at me or something and nicole's the same way and it's like i personally would never do that but i if that's what you need <laughs> of me as a leader i will serve you know what i mean but you yeah, know yeah. some people are more oh, you'll like, serve nice <laughs> <laughs> and then like and then some people are more like hey like i prefer if yeah i don't i obviously want feedback but like do you deliver it in a way that is not the meaning do you know what i mean yeah, so it's yeah. like no you have to like figure out like feel out sense of feelers like how people react to these things and you can have you can just have these conversations like hey how do you like receive feedback and then yeah um if it's like in a way where 
they're having issues receiving it even when you're trying to deliver it the best way then you can have that conversation later but as a leader just kind of read you know how people like to receive feedback and then give it to them and then also try to be someone that is very open to all mistakes anyone can call you up for anything so if people have an issue with my calling like what they feel like this call this was round uh, this round was called poorly like they can bring in a broad review or i'll be the first one to say it most of the time i'll be the one to say i'll be like, guys this this is the, honestly you guys probably made mistakes but it doesn't matter this one's on me because i made this mistake and it ruined the round for us or i'll be like mm. nope i guys i i whiffed if don't worry about it like if i hit this if i get this kill this round isn't even a problem so being that person to call yourself out and like be normal about it and also have a be when normal. I say be normal about it, like, don't be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I lost this round. <laughs> Fuck. Like, don't do that. Like, be normal or don't, be normal. you know what I mean? Like, cool. I don't, like that. Be don't normal. go over the top. This is not Dragon Ball Z. Sure. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, just, it's like another, you're always going to make mistakes. And, like, I, I think accountability is a theme because, like, I think it's something that, like, transcends gaming. Like, everyone is trying to be a better person today than they were yesterday and constantly improve in every aspect of life. And I feel like that's helped me you know, in my personal life with my friendships and like my relationships and stuff like that. And just like being a person outside of the game is just, you know, trying to think of ways like I can like improve and be better because no one is perfect and everyone yeah. is constantly, and especially in a game like Valorant that changes so often, things are changing constantly. Your protocols are changing constantly. How you view the game is changing constantly. How you play the game is changing all the time. So having a, accountability as the baseline of everything, literally yeah, everything. I agree. I think accountability, I think accountability and to a certain degree, like respect are two huge fundamentals that if you have accountability and respect for each mm -hmm. other, man, you can take any, well, not any team, but you can take a, a, like a mid team and push them really forward because once you have those two things in place, like you can learn so much in such a short period of time. Okay. I swear to God, this is the last question. You're but good. That's, <laughs> with, with Effie's and his like blunt approach or a straightforward approach in like a very good way um we were just talking about uh feedback critique calling out mistakes how does because i i know like it's very hard for people to receive feedback of like i say that your gameplay is bad you did this incorrectly let's assume that it's like with positive intent and like people aren't being disrespectful or toxic about it but like receiving or giving feedback critique uh, is often not fun and it can be like I guess shut down people oftentimes so what's your thoughts or your advice on as a player how do you go about receiving negative feedback about your gameplay your calls your your attitude your whatever it might be like how do you receive feedback so that it doesn't shut you down you can actually take that information and use it for your growth that's a good question I have to think about it because I feel like I'm in a pretty good spot right now. Like, obviously, like, some days are going to, like, waver. And that's, like, to get it clear, like, not every day you're going to be like, yeah, totally fine. Because after, <laughs> the thing about it, you go weeks yeah, yeah. and weeks and weeks and weeks being told this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad for weeks and weeks and weeks. It'll obviously, you know, it'll have a toll on you at some point. But, like, for it sure. is, like, a personal responsibility as a player and an, an individual level to be like, these things are going to happen. You're never, almost never going to be perfect. Like, mistakes are always going to be made. And Valorant is a game of who makes the least amount of mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's very, very, very rare you see a perfect game. Because if it's a perfect game in Valorant, there's a 13 0 and everyone's going to be alive 5v0. You know, flawless, 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 flawless. So yeah. obviously, there's going to be mistakes. And the game is, um, there's opportunity for like playmaking and stuff like that. So it's very hard to have a perfect game of Valorant. And two teams also playing two perfect games of Valorant, the game would never end. It would just go into OT, right? Over and over and over. <laughs> so. It's like, you know, it, knowing that this is going, this is just a part of the job is, it's honestly just improvement at the end of the day. And for me, it's just like, if I'm having a hard time, like, um, like receiving feedback on like a specific moment, I try to like take a breath. I'll, just, I'll literally just do a deep breath. I'll take like four, four in, pause, four in, uh, out four. I'll literally take a deep breath and I'll be like, okay, at the end of the day, like I am playing a game and I'm just trying to get better at the game. And this person is just trying to help me get better at the game. That's yeah. it. So... You know, especially if it's like a high intense game and like, let's say we're getting something um, like anything can happen. Right. And so you're just sitting there and you just need to realize that this is just a part of the job and take a breath. And honestly, it ain't that, it ain't that deep. The person I hope, like I said, if, if it was said with positive intent, they just went, they're only saying it to see you get better. And it's the same way that you get criticism by others because you want to see them get better. And rarely you're saying that because you think they're a dog shit awful player <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. Like you're never saying it because of that. And so just kind of bring it back the idea that you're just trying to get better and i try to bring myself more to the moment by breathing 
and that's what helps me at least. Sorry, I don't know if yeah. I was that good of an answer. I feel like I've no, got it's, it's, years of experience at this point. I feel like I can receive feedback pretty well. <laughs> it's a it's a tough question because like whether it's an 18 year old or a 35, 40 year old, people often struggle with receiving feedback because it feels like it's an attack on either who I am or my character or my yeah. expertise. And so it's very hard for people to accept that feedback. And I think um, I think this is where trust comes in a lot. Like if if I trust, if let's say that we're teammates and I trust you, when you are telling me that I'm playing or that I'm doing something wrong, if, if that true fundamental trust is there, I don't assume that you are attacking my character or my skill. I assume that you are trying to help me become a better version of myself because you mm -hmm. see something that I don't. Right. And if you can get that like really deep level of trust, and obviously easier said than done, but if you can get there, the feedback doesn't feel like an attack because you know that mm -hmm. this person that is telling me this thing wants to see me become better. They're not telling me because they think I'm dog shit and they hate playing with me. They're telling me because they want to see their teammate become the best version of themselves possible. And like, I think obviously again, easier said than done, but that's mm -hmm. understanding that there has to be a, a deep level of, and this also goes back to that like performance trust graph, right? Like there has to be that trust between players. Otherwise feedback is always going to be received negatively, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we're very well past an hour now at this point, Mel. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing your insight. Uh, I think, I mean, you've, you teach me a lot every time we chat, and this conversation has been very eye opening. I'm sure a lot of people are going to love to hear some of the things that you said. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate you giving me all your insights, sharing your experience, and it's really great to see where you are now compared to where you were a year ago, compared to two years ago, compared to three years ago, and excited to see where you'll be next year. Oh, you are so nice. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad. I'm sorry we had to reschedule this like five times, but I'm really right. happy to make it happen finally. Thank yeah, you for having no. me. Seriously. Yeah, likewise. It was a lot of fun.